So I think we'll get underway now. It's a couple of minutes after seven. We may be joined by a few others, but uh, welcome those of you who are here uh, already. Great to see you. And uh, Gerald Ahrens is here as well uh, from Como Energy. And of course, in the background, again, we've got um, uh, Tom Bazelier, who's uh, been handling the, the tech side of things for us. Um, just a couple of uh, administrative things to start with. Um, we did ask um, uh, Emerald and uh, uh, Pakenham to send out um, a circular, uh, sorry, uh, some, some reading material from Gerald. Uh, did anybody receive that? Uh, Neil did. Yeah. Okay. Terrific. That's good. Um, the other thing is that um, there is a site visit. Um, this is our last session now for, for Emerald. Uh, and uh, in a couple of weeks time, we've got the site visit up to Mount Tulbawong to see uh, Glenn's um, energy lab and also to the, the Wandon uh, Yarra Valley uh, water treatment plant. And we have to do a separate registration for that um, because people have been coming and going uh, in the program as you will have noticed um, but for insurance purposes um, we do and, and also for uh, health and safety we do need to have a separate registration for people who will definitely be coming so today I sent to Emerald and Pakenham uh, the uh, URL for that registration and uh, if you are interested in coming along to one or both of those uh, uh, sites, then uh, do fill out the registration and it will only be those people who fill out the registration form uh, who will be informed of uh, how to get to the, the sites. So uh, do sign up if you're, if you're interested. So it is uh, quite an important night tonight, being our, our final night of the, the series of four uh, seminars uh, that, we, that we have run or webinars. And um, it's uh, great to have uh, Gerald here with us. Before we, um, before I introduce Gerald, I would like to just uh, make an acknowledgement of country and acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. And I'd also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians who might be present tonight. Um, yeah, I, um, I first met uh, Gerald uh, a, a few years ago now, I think two, or two, two and a half years ago, yeah. probably. Um, uh, Gerald and Jonathan are from Como Energy, and um, I won't go into the details to explain that uh, business. Uh, Gerald can do that far better than I can. Uh, but they put a little video together uh, to describe the sort of work that they do for community energy groups. So they're consultants and um, they can provide quite a lot of uh, skills in the, in the energy field uh, for community energy groups that don't have specialists uh, amongst their volunteers. I got quite excited when I uh, saw the video and heard what they had to say and uh, jumped onto, onto them immediately. And um, the first uh, sort of little project that we worked on together, well, it wasn't really little, it was quite a big one. It was something like a, uh, a I think a $2 million grant application to the federal government uh, to set up uh, a feasibility study for a microgrid in Hillsville. Uh, there was a huge amount of work involved in it. it one of the bigger, uh, biggest applications uh, I've ever been involved in. And that, as someone who's coming, uh, you know, who was president of a, a local community energy group, uh, it was a great experience for me because um, we'd been dealing with small council grants, you know, $5,000, $10,000 and federal government grants of two or $3,000. Uh, and to work on something like this was um, uh, quite an eye opener to see the amount of work involved in it, the complexities involved in it. And... Um, realizing of course that we could never uh, on our own have uh, put in an application like that to the federal government and this showed me immediately one of the huge values of working with industry partners um, and so so that um, we can collaborate uh, and utilize a much broader range of skills and then um, what happened after that was uh, the Victorian government uh, decided that they were going to make funding available, uh, half a million dollars for seven 
uh, to, to each community power hub for seven hubs around Victoria. Um, and uh, I spoke again with Gerald about that. I thought we probably didn't have the, the skills to be able to put in the complexity uh, that was required uh, for that sort of application. And um, in the end, uh, Gerald and I worked on that uh, grant application and we were very successful, uh, as you know. And uh, that meant that Hillsville Corps was able to get this funding. The great thing about it was that um, we were an additional hub. Um, there was only one going to be in Melbourne. And in fact, uh, the government ended up providing or Sustainability Victoria ended up providing the grant to uh, two groups uh, and we were the, the second one. So it was I, I, we, it, it's very clear in my mind that we would never have been able to get that grant without the uh, support that we got from um, the professional skills and the knowledge of, uh, of Gerald and Jonathan and particularly the work that Gerald did was uh, really fantastic. But we also got a lot of support, of course, from our uh, local community energy groups. And we ended up getting 52 letters of support, uh, which was uh, a bit mind blowing for people in its sustainability Victoria. But it was uh, due to, uh, a credit to all of the uh, volunteers in those groups uh, and the, the people that they knew in their communities that enabled us to get all of that. And of course, Gerald worked with us, and he will go into more detail about this. Gerald and Jonathan uh, worked with us um, throughout the life of the hub, and uh, they uh, triaged quite a, lo a lot of projects. You know, community groups come up with a whole heap of ideas um, that we would like to see happen, and it requires uh, skilled professionals to triage these, to look at what is possible, what isn't. Um, what can we do in the time frame that we have available, and then to start doing feasibility studies and business cases for them as well. And um, <clears throat> was very challenging for me to be involved with uh, Gerald and Jonathan um, on that project, um, because I don't have a technical background, but that's why they were on board. And uh, it was really interesting for me uh, to do that work interesting, challenging, and very exciting. And the projects that <clears throat> we, uh, we ended up putting together, uh, I think were, uh, were really interesting. And Gerald will talk about those projects tonight, I imagine. Um, yeah, so uh, Gerald, I think um, perhaps if you come on board now, I've uh, indicated what my, uh, my connection with you is and uh, why you're involved on uh, in this particular seminar. I'll hand over to you and um, you can introduce yourself further and Como Energy and the work that you do as industry consultants. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jeff, for, for all that background. It's, it, it's good to be able to do this uh, seminar tonight, uh, sort of uh, rounding out the work that we've done for the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub. And it's good to see Ray here, who was obviously heavily involved in that uh, as well for uh, Clean Energy in Olympics. So uh, good to see you, uh, Ray. Uh, the, the way I'm hoping to, to do this seminar tonight will be very, very interactive. So uh, you will not be able to hide behind, behind mute buttons. Um, I, I want to have really a lot of engagement and I want you to challenge whatever I say. And I want you to provide alternative thinking uh, uh, whenever possible. Let me maybe just very briefly uh, share screen and uh, just introduce who who we are. Is sorry, just give me one moment. Um, might for the moment just be able to move. Uh, so so Como Energy is um, uh, was set up six years ago between Jonathan Prendergast and myself. Uh, Jonathan is extremely well known in the, especially in the New South Wales market, uh, but also in Victoria for his work in corporate power purchase agreements and how to make them green. Uh, and he has both his own uh, consulting business in that field, but he's also working as an energy innovation consultant for UTS, who is a leader in devising new schemes in that field. And he was also the founding director of the Business Renewable Centre uh, in Australia, which is an organisation mimicking an evolution in uh, America, where the Rocky Mountains Institute, I believe, uh, put together a business renewable center in order to teach the, the corporate public uh, about uh, renewable energy 
uh, power purchase agreements and uh, the BRCA here in Australia was looking to transfer that that uh, that approach of uh, learning through a, a industry organization in, into the Australian market. I myself, I've been involved in renewables now for 15 years. Uh, I'm a lawyer by training and uh, I first had contact with renewables uh, in Germany about 15 years ago where I was working for three years uh, as general counsel and head of international business development and project development for a German contractor and developer. So we were setting up um, what by Australian standards would be small solar farms in, in the realm of one to five megawatt, uh, each uh, around Germany and then Southern Europe, Spain, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, France, uh, Czech Republic, and ended up uh, doing work here in Australia on the Maurice Solar flagship and on the Granoff Solar River farm for, for that same contractor and ended up here in this country. And for the past 10 years, I've been running my own legal practice, uh, Pegasus Legal as a renewable energy boutique. Uh, but then six years ago, I also set up a Como Energy with Jonathan to develop small-scale solar farms and uh, to to work as an agent of change, really, for the renewable energy sector that in Australia is split very much between uh, small-scale, successful residential schemes, whether that's uh, solar hot water systems or PV, um, and uh, the very large-scale sector of building hundreds of megawatts of solar farm uh, at a time, and we were really interested in um, promoting a sector that looks at what we call community scale projects <clears throat> that can be distributed around the country. And what, one of our slogans is that uh, solar farms should be as common as farm sheds in Australia. And they're not. And uh, we're, we're trying to solve some of the conundrums as to why that is not the case. Uh, and uh, so I've set up Como Energy with Jonathan and I was also involved in setting up Sunshine Hydro where we develop pump hydro schemes, but I'm no longer actively involved in that at the moment. Um, just to, to give you an idea on some of the live projects that we're currently working on, um, very high profile uh, has the Grong Grong Solar Farm for two reasons. One is uh, we recently uh, undertook a crowd equity race, the first crowd equity race in Australia for a solar farm uh, on the virtual platform where we raised $750,000 to help build that project. And it's the host solar farm for the Haystack Solar Garden, which is a race that is currently underway as we speak. And it's a one and a half megawatt solar farm battery ready uh, for the future. Uh, the, the Goulburn uh, community solar farm, you might hear more of that later on, on today. Uh, this is an interesting uh, collaboration again with the community group. Um, they had worked on a solar farm project on the outskirts of Goulburn for many years and had gotten to the point where the federal policy uncertainty after ditching Malcolm Turnbull led them to step back from the project and not to pursue it any further. And Jonathan had been in touch with them a few times over the years. And he said, well, before you completely mothball that project, let us have a look at this and see whether we can take it further. And uh, we are now actually about to go into construction. It still took three years to get to that point, but finally we, we are able to take it to construction. And uh, the community has done an absolutely amazing job in raising now nearly $2.5 million in equity in order to build this project. We've uh, recently worked uh, for uh, about 18 months on the Kaura um, solar battery microgrid, uh, another interesting project uh, led by a community organization. Not, It's not community funded yet, but it, it's com a community led uh, development. And we were uh, just consultants to that project, um, which is looking to group together a number of industrial uh, customers in the energy market under one gate meter and uh, embed them into a microgrid in order to uh, do various energy related activities, including deploying a uh, gas engine and a solar and battery for micro purposes. We're helping the, at the moment the Gloucester community um, uh, with their solar farm project. Uh, the actual project itself has um, had to be abandoned and we're currently shifting it to an alternative project uh, because the network um, told us that we can only export 30 kilowatt. We wanted to have export 500 kilowatt. So that's that's an interesting development that does happen. And it's something that we need to talk about later. I'm listing it here because there's an interesting learning in that. And we're, we're working with the Banyip uh, group, uh, Bragg, on uh, a, a small scale solar farm, 800 uh, kilowatt, one and a half uh, megawatt hour of battery storage and one megawatt of solar. Uh, so that that's work that's currently underway and uh, that was also seeded uh, during the period of the community 
Yarra Valley Community Power Hub. And we're supporting the Manila Group um, in their uh, discussions with another commercial developer. Uh, and, and we've been effectively funded by the New South Wales State Government to support Manila specifically in understanding the commercial structures that they need to operate in. Uh, I will come back to some of these projects because I think they will ultimately bring, uh, bring some interesting learnings. So one of the perspectives that I want to take in, uh, during the seminar uh, is uh, you're all interested in renewable energy uh, and one way of channeling that interest is through one of the many uh, and wonderful community energy groups that are uh, active around the country. Now, some of these activities of community energy groups will be things that are well within the means of those community energy groups, um, like uh, capacity building. Um, Hillsville Core has uh, done a lot of work around um, uh, 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 city CRM, and, which is a customer relationship management tool, um, and, and training organizations up as to how to use them to build uh, contact databases and manage them well. Uh, a lot of community energy groups have run bulk buys, have run educational uh, courses, have uh, held information sessions, have, have talked about energy efficiency uh, to, the, to the public. There's a lot of work that community energy groups can do extremely well themselves. Where it gets more challenging is where community energy groups are looking to undertake larger projects, such as developing a, a solar farm or a battery project. Uh, or developing a microgrid. And a lot of these ambitions uh, are expressed in community energy groups. And um, this is where I think collaboration with industry is particularly important. And uh, we will see how that can actually uh, pan out. So the perspective that I want you to take here is, even if you're completely new to renewable energy uh, or, or working in that field, uh, I want you to imagine that you're joining a community energy group and that you are on the committee and that you are faced with some of the decisions and questions that a committee in such an organization has to take. Uh, and uh, Ray can probably speak to that uh, as much as Jeff. Uh, they are both performing roles in community energy groups. They don't need to be technical experts, but they need to, they need to apply their mind uh, to a set of problems that are sometimes general business in nature and sometimes very technical energy related matters. And so, so I hope that in, in the course of this evening, uh, you, you can imagine yourself in a community energy group uh, that thinks about projects and thinks about engaging with industry in order to bring these projects uh, to fruition. Have you got any questions so far? Uh, I'd, I'd love it if you could uh, put yourself on, on camera so, so that we have a very limited amount of eye contact. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's get moving. And uh, for Ray, a lot of this will be familiar because uh, I'm, I'm drawing examples from the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that um, th that we want to explore here is uh, what are the areas where you really need this uh, community uh, industry relationship. Uh, so we 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 identified four themes that. Uh, the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub, which brought together a, a number of groups in, in the Yarra Valley. Uh, there were a number of common themes that we tried to, uh, to channel in, into activities. One was bulk buy activities, where effectively the community groups bring together local custom uh, to, say, solar installers or heat pump installers uh, and try to get a better outcome. Um, and the, the question is, what is that better outcome? Uh, there, there are multiple ways that can be answered, but we, we don't need to go too deeply into that. Uh, and, and these bulk buys, uh, two areas that uh, came up, one was solar bulk buy, a very typical thing for community energy groups to engage in. And it depends really on how much solar uptake you already have, whether there's still scope for that. Another area are heat pump uh, bulk buys, both for hot water, but possibly even for, for uh, space heating. Or, or cooling. Um, and then there was one, one activity uh, around LED lighting, which uh, Banyip was actually spearheading at the time because they had managed to get an LED lighting upgrade for the recreation reserve down there. And then there was a lot of interest in mid-scale solar and storage. Um, 
uh, this was not, these were not all the activities, uh, but, but some of the key ones that I want to explore here. And if you then look at um, some of the um, community action that needed to come out of this, if you look at the bulk buys, uh, you might want to set up preferred terms and prices with local suppliers. So that's a commercial negotiation. Um, if you want to do a heat pump bulk buy activity, you the, the, the main constraint that was identified uh, that the community would help uh, resolve is advocacy and be a trusted source of information. Um, LED lighting upgrades, uh, again, continued advocacy, research, and promotion. But when it came to mid-scale solar and storage development, what was identified very quickly was that uh, the community energy groups required support in developing these assets. So when you talk about mid-scale solar and, and storage or community scale, what, what that means is securing the land uh, through adequate means. Uh, it is um, undertaking a concept design, a network uh, inquiry and possibly network studies in order to see whether such an asset can even be connected to the network and undertake a, a planning process for that. So there's some fairly complicated and complex uh, uh, work streams that are in that field. And uh, it was felt there that uh, Como Energy needs to undertake the development activities and that the community groups would undertake support for those development activities. And ultimately, um, once these projects are ready for community investment, they might take over and undertake the investment process in the community, very much like Gloucester is or Manila is or Goulburn is in, in, in other locations. And we, we then looked at uh, who is effectively the, the owner of these projects. Um, obviously, all of that work went through the community power hub. Um, but in the bulk buy section, Como Energy was really only able to support the setup, um, developing some content and help with the establishment of these campaigns. <clears throat> Whereas when it came to uh, community um, uh, solar development, uh, the community energy groups and Como Energy together would undertake the development activities. So we've been working, for example, with Banyip uh, quite closely uh, to secure a lease over the land, uh, uh, to identify various concept designs uh, uh, and identify the preferred one around community financing uh, ambition or uh, expectations and uh, uh, submitted a network inquiry in order to, to promote that project. So you can see that there are different levels of involvement in, in these various work streams uh, that you can find and that, uh, that sometimes emphasize skills that are already in the community and sometimes skills that are not yet in the community. And one of the activities we undertook early on in the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub, we, we tried to identify what can be achieved by community energy groups. Uh, and we, we were looking at uh, the, the climate impact of these activities. And we were looking at the effort and the ability to achieve these activities. Um, some activities were identified as being very achievable, but having potentially a relatively low climate impact because uh, they are more educational in nature. So there are a lot of steps between education and actual climate impact. Tonight we're doing an educational event and, and that, that's wonderful and has a very important place to play uh, because it, it, it broadens the skill set in, in, in society uh, to ensure that there are more people that can take projects forward, but it has not an immediate climate impact. So it would, would take one of you to, to step forward into a community energy group, uh, initiate a project to then ultimately achieve a direct climate impact. Then there were some activities like uh, Banyip's LED lighting acti uh, activities in, uh, on their recreation reserve that have a very clear impact and a very measurable impact and that are still relatively straightforward to achieve. They went through council and, and grant funding in order to achieve this uh, LED lighting. So that, 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 that was a great activity and a great example where community energy groups actually don't need industry any further because they, they can take these learnings from one group to the next group and uh, see whether they can uh, implement more projects of that nature. But then sort of as you move across uh, the slide, uh, you identify more projects that are harder to achieve in order to achieve a climate impact. So mid-scale solar and storage are, are very difficult uh, projects to implement. They are 
they require a high effort and uh, require a high level of skill in order to be achieved. But if you achieve them, they have a very significant climate impact just because of their scale. Our microgrid projects, uh, such as the one we were exploring with Healdsville Core, uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, again, a very complex project, but not as immediate a climate impact because it still depends on how you how you energize that microgrid. Uh, a microgrid as such is just a is just poles and wires. It's not yet renewable energy. So, so one of the activities that we undertook with uh, the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub, we looked at a, a very long list of uh, ambitions and ideas and uh, uh, approaches and projects that were already underway and try to classify them uh, on, on this uh, sort of uh, graph to see how can we either achieve a great impact or how uh, by, by allowing complexity to happen or how do we uh, achieve something that the community groups can undertake uh, in their own right without requiring industry in input and being able to promote the knowledge that has already been built and the skills that have already been disseminated. Uh, in, in, into other groups. And uh, sort of a last general slide before I stop talking and get, get you all involved. Uh, the approach that Como Energy takes is um, that we're here to support. We are a business. We are a small business, but we are a business. And we, we are certainly required in order to pay salary to, to make a return on our investment somewhere. But we are always here to support. We are willing to lead activities. But the fact that we're willing to lead doesn't mean we always have to lead. Uh, sometimes industry needs to take a step back and let the community energy groups uh, lead. And we're happy to take the load. And I think this is what Jeff and I uh, undertook when when it came to this grant writing that uh, that we explored for the microgrid and then for for this uh, Yarra Valley Community Power Hub itself. Uh, we would have been happy for for Jeff to write the applications, uh, but uh, because he said he didn't have the skills that were necessary, we were happy to take that load. I think that's, that's really important. Volunteers don't always have the time. And even if they have the time, they don't always have the skills that are necessary. And that, that's where you need to have someone from, from industry to be able to step in and take over some of these, uh, these work streams. And what we wanted to achieve is we wanted to build capacity in the community. We wanted to have local engagement. And we wanted to partner and collaborate. Because for us as a small business, and this is, this is quite an important aspect in our uh, in our work, as a small business, we can't be everywhere where we want to have projects. So for us, it is really important that we have local partners and who is better a local partner than local community energy groups. So partnering with, with local uh, groups for us is actually a way of overcoming one of the shortcomings of being a small business. So um, one of the first uh, questions that arise um, when you engage with community energy uh, so when you engage in community energy groups and want to engage industry expertise, is you engage with businesses. How do you pay for it? And uh, I, I put this front and center because ultimately, uh, a lot of these activities that require industry expertise are not only not only require funding to buy that industry expertise, but quite significant funding. Because there's a lot of what we call external costs. It's not you. You can engage someone like Como or other developers to to help with developing a project, but there's a significant external cost as well. Uh, you you might need planning consultants. You might need lawyers. You might need um, uh, grid engineers. And the cost of some of these projects is quite substantial. Uh, I'll come to some numbers a bit later. On. So the first thing I want to explore with you is. Uh, Hopefully, a relatively simple question, uh, but but one that is not trivial. How do you pay for industry advice? And I, I will actually go out of my presenter mode, and I'm looking to populate this with your help. So, um, who who would like to go first? And um, I, I I ended sorry. I identified a number of funding sources um, that we can go through, and I would like you to. Put yourself into the shoes of being a committee member in a community energy group that wants to engage whatever it is, a, a town planner uh, to explore a community uh, solar farm or an engineer to, to draw up some concept designs. And imagine it will cost $15,000, $20,000 uh, for, for a task or you need a grid engineer 
that needs to be paid for uh, $150,000 for grid engineering. Uh, it, it could be a, a lawyer that you need uh, to, to draw up a lease over, over land, and that might cost $3,000. So it could be anything, a, a few thousand dollars to, to a very significant amount of money. How do you engage with industry? Which, which way would you prefer, and what are the considerations that you need to apply? Who would like to put up uh, their hand? If, if nobody puts up their hand, I will pick someone. Okay, <laughs> Lindell, thank you for being courageous. Um, we could apply for a grant. Yeah, so um, grant funding. Yes. Um, a, a very typical source for, for community uh, energy groups, and uh, I, I think... Um, as Jeff indicated, there are grants available at, at various levels. There are council level grants, there's maybe some philanthropic organizations that you can go to, um, state government, federal government. So what are some of the considerations that in a committee meeting you would need to think about when, when you talk about grant funding? So one thing we already identified, who, well, you, who, pro, who, provides, the, who provides the grant? Uh, who provides as well as um, what the, the limitations are? Yeah. What, what limitations are you thinking about? Well, they won't just hand you money. There'll be specific things you need to tick in order to get funding. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the limitations are because I haven't applied. <laughs> so. Yeah. So there might be specific requirements. What, what, what else do you need? What else need, do you need to think about? I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy for others to chip in as well, by the way. Uh, in-kind uh, work that you'd have to put in. Yeah. You, you might need to make in-kind contributions. Yeah. Who's, who has the skills to actually, you know, write the grant? Yeah. Um, could I suggest one? Um, is there even a grant available? A lot of grants come uh, at specific times in the budget cycle. Uh, some come at specific times in the election cycle. So um, what grants are available? Uh, another thing is, um, so you, you've come together in a, in a committee meeting, you've identified, uh, say you want a concept design for a, uh, for a small solar farm or for a, um, you, you want to put 200 kilowatt of solar on, on the recreation reserve. You need a concept design for that. Um, Lindell suggests uh, that you could go for a, a grant application. What happens next in, in terms of the timeframes? Well, every grant comes with a time frame at which you have to acquit it. Um, and that time frame. Uh, for a project such as this is going to have to be a fairly long time frame. So you need to apply for a grant which has got that sort of time frame. So yeah. I'm thinking you'd be looking at at least a, a year, maybe two years to try and complete it, I would think. Yeah. Uh, what, what I was also thinking about, uh, Mike, is um, if you want to apply for a grant, first you need to have a grant opportunity open that you can apply for. And then the grant decision has to be made. A lot of these decisions around grants can take a very long time. And we, we've seen grant applications that were meant to be announced uh, by a certain time. It took several months longer uh, to have them announced. So um, uh, you, you need to think about the application time frame. But, but also you need to think about that. Uh, this is a very good point. You need to have a grant uh, that uh, you need to have a, a grant of sufficient duration to allow your activity to be performed. Mm -hmm. Just with grants as well, um, you need a plan B always because um, grants are a bit fickle sometimes. You can yep. never guarantee yep. their success at all. Yeah. Um, and and I, I think that that's probably enough for the grant funding. Uh, it, it, what, what I was hoping to draw out and it has come out beautifully, grants are great uh, because they provide funding to organizations that don't have funding. And typically, they are not repayable. Uh, so you can literally use the money and spend the money and achieve an outcome. But a lot needs to come together. You need to have 
someone providing a grant. You need to be able to meet the requirements of the grant. You need to think about whether you can provide the in-kind contribution, whether there is such a requirement. You need someone to write the grant. Uh, there's an application time frame. It can take longer than you want uh, for your project. The, the grant needs to have a sufficient duration so that you can acquit it adequately. So there are a lot of obstacles in the way of, uh, of grant opportunities uh, that often make grants um, a fairly poor choice if you want to drive forward a community initiative. So you need to think about a plan B. I think that was a very, uh, very, very good suggestion. What are the, uh, what are our plans B or C or D or E? Are you talking about for other funding operate, um, yeah. possibilities? Yeah. Say, uh, say, you, say you want a, you want a concept design for a 200 yeah. kilowatt rooftop or for a, for a small scale solar farm just on the outskirts of town. Um, uh, we've, we've got a few items here. Pick one and uh, have, think it through as to, as to what, what are the core cons considerations. Well, supplier funding comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so when you, when you talk about the, say, the concept design for a, um, for a solar asset, the supplier would, in that case, be the uh, solar installer, uh, as an example. Yeah. Okay. So play that through, uh, through in your mind. Um, if you go to a solar installer for a concept design, what are the considerations that you would want to apply? Uh, one is the, uh, if, effectively, if you want it to be a, a community development, if it, at the end of the day, you want the community to own the asset. So there has to be the, uh, the payback time, how it's going to be reimbursed over time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, yes. Um, that, that's probably, can, can we park that question? Um, so at the moment, we're just looking for funding for a concept design. You, you've come up with the concept of having 200 kilowatt solar on the recreation reserve. Um, in order to take this any further, say to council who owns the recreation reserve, um, you, you, need to, you need to show people what you're talking about. So you, you just want funding $8,000 for a concept design. Uh, we are not yet talking about how it will be funded and whether it can be community owned or any of those questions. Um, we are just thinking about how do we get funding for an engineering task that that is a first step in a in a long series of steps. Well, a major drawback for the supplier funding is that it locks you into a supplier, so you only exactly. have one choice. Yeah. So, so a lot of uh, solar installers. Um, uh, will be happy to provide a concept design because for them it's a first step in a sales process and quite often there will be the spoken or unspoken expectation that ultimately they get the job mm. and that's fair enough uh, they're putting in the effort of providing a concept design so why would they not have that expectation but uh, you, you, you're ultimately locked into a supplier this was actually one of the situations that uh, the Goldman uh, group experienced they were looking at a specific mounting structure for their solar farm and the supplier had offered them a, um, a, a concept design and some support in, in, in driving forward the applications. But ultimately it was very specific to that mounting structure. Uh, so they couldn't use anything else and uh, it would have locked in that supplier uh, for good in the project. And when we did the analysis, it was actually a very poor choice for that project uh, because it, it was, that that mounting structure was designed for for a different purpose than uh, the problem that Goldman was looking to solve. So you're locked into a supplier. Are there any other constraints? I'm just wondering if it's possible to write a document that seeks um, like a request for proposals. So you actually rather than just go to one supplier, yeah. you, you could go to a number and, and ask them to come up with a concept. Yeah. And that way you're picking the brains of the experts yeah. that have done it before. Yeah, uh, and, and that's a strategy that, uh, that people often follow in order to get some learnings and some concepts. You go to three, four, five suppliers and see what each of them comes up with. Yeah. Um, the, the, the concern that uh, can come up is that you're, you're still relying on the goodwill of organizations and you, you feel ultimately indebted to multiple organizations. 
uh, to a degree. Um, but it, it is certainly a way of getting a first level of information from multiple parties. If, if these suppliers learn that you speak to multiple organizations, they will be less forthcoming with their support. Mm. So, so I think what, one of the things that, that I've seen over and over again is that you can engage with a supplier quite well, but they will have a strong expectation that they're going exclusive on, uh, on this opportunity with you. So the question is, uh, are you required to provide exclusivity on, on a commercial basis? That process expression of interest is quite typical for supplying a yeah. major project yeah. materials and I think it's pretty standard um, I understand the requirement for exclusive exclusivity whatever that is um, right. yeah that one <laughs> yeah exclusive you have to go to a real estate agent and um, ask them to sell your house the first thing they'll get out is the exclusive uh, contract yeah um, but yes that seems quite valuable. Because at it, least you might farm out, you might fish out some of the supplies you haven't even thought about. Yeah, it, it is certainly an extremely valid uh, way to get a first level of information going. Where, where I find it more challenging is when, when you work with a specific supplier, they, they, will, they will give you a plan. And if you want to take that further, uh, you will say, okay, you gave me a, a PDF document here that, that I've been able to branch about. Uh, would you mind giving me this in AutoCAD format, uh, so in the native file format, so that I can give this to another town planner and, and get the planning application going? And this is where where you start getting the friction in in, in the relationship uh, if you if you haven't offered more than uh, than an expression of interest. But it is a valid and important uh, route to get some activity going. Um, if you're locked into like. You know, when you're talking about using asking a supplier to give you the information, it's not just being locked into the supplier, but locked into what they would normally provide. So it may be that you have a number of options and they are only able to deliver one. So if you had a, a number of different concepts which could be suitable, you won't get to see them. <clears throat> yeah. So we could say each supplier typically has one solution um, uh, and you need to approach. Uh, need to approach several suppliers in order to, to, to get really a range of options. Mm. Yeah, mm. these are all really good points. Um, okay, can, can I ask about, uh, you're on the committee of an organization, a community energy group, uh, how about using your own funds? Maybe Ray, could, would, would you like to take this one? Uh, this is a very challenging one because generally community energy groups don't have a lot of money. Um, I know in, in the one I belong to, Clean Energy Nilambic, um, we, we never really had much money. Um, so uh, I, I don't, I think for perhaps many community energy groups, this particular way of raising money is, um, is probably not viable. Um, so uh, yeah, it's unlikely, yes, as you're right. It's unlikely to be viable, I think. Yeah. And uh, uh, I should say uh, clean energy in Olympic, from my experience, is actually uh, one of the more powerful, more, more organized community energy groups. Um, they've got a lot of skill and uh, bring a lot of energy uh, to the tasks that they perform. Uh, but as, as you hear from Ray, um, even such an organization often lives off the smell of an oily rag um, in, in terms of uh, meeting their cost. So internal funding is usually not available because where would that internal funding come from? It would come from uh, membership contributions. And uh, people that volunteer their time are often not, uh, often not willing to volunteer also a substantial membership fee. Um, what about donations or at-risk loans from within the community? So could you just go out and say, Hey, we've got this idea about a um, uh, about a solar array on on the recreation reserve. Uh, we we need to raise eight thousand dollars in order to in order to get uh, some engineering done. Is, is that a good solution? Is that is that a pathway? Might work if you if you approach the football club and netball club that 
that are using the, uh, the facility mm -hmm. because it'd be in their own interests ultimately. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, so one of the questions uh, is, uh, are the interests sufficiently aligned? Um, so if, if somebody has a benefit out of uh, one of these opportunities, um, then they might be willing to fund. Um, Ray and uh, Jeff, can I ask you both, have you seen donations coming in from within the community to pay for expenses in, in your respective groups? Um, donations from the community, if they do come in, are usually very small amounts and not many of them. And uh, it's only very occasionally that you get someone who's got a bit of spare money um, that they want to throw around that you get, might get two or $3,000 from someone. Um, but um, whether they would want that to be at risk uh, in, in, with a project like this would be another matter. Mm -hmm. Our experience has been that they just want to provide some general funding to support the administrative uh, functions of the organization. Mm -hmm. But we've never actually gone out and asked for at-risk loans. Yeah. Ray, Ray, have you ever raised money just in form of donations or asked people to lend money to, to a specific cause? Um, no, I, th I think generally not. Um, I don't think the membership or, or the committee um, thought that that would be a for the effort that might be required to go in and approach people and or just to ask for donations. Uh, I think people felt that there, there wouldn't be much of a return on that effort. Yeah. Um, so no, we haven't really done much of that. Not not that I not that I'm aware of. Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Um, so the Goldman Group they had actually gone out. Um, very early on to fund some activities through loans and and effectively what they said is um uh, while these were at risk loans if the project had completely fallen over they would have um, those projects would have been lost uh so that those loans would have been lost uh but as the project progresses uh, these loans uh, are being repaid so so they have done this but it was relatively modest amounts but it would have been enough to to fund a concept design on, on something what about uh, pro bono advice. So, uh, we talk about pro bono advice when you go to a consultant and ask them do something for good, pro bono. Uh, so, so you, you just ask them to provide professional services and not charge for it. Is that is that a good pathway? Would be nice if it worked. <laughs> but, uh, first, you've got to get the person with the expertise, and yeah. if you after a big job. So asking someone who's got the expertise to do a big job, they're usually employed. So usually they'll put you at the back of their, their timeline and the work that you want done in three months won't get done in 12 months. So it's an unlikely source of, it might give you a little bit of expertise, but not the amount you would need. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, Mike, what, what stood out in your comment there for me is, uh, obviously you need the right person being willing to provide pro bono advice. Uh, but you might be at the back of the timeline. It, it is a risk. It's not not always a given, um, but it is a risk that if you're a non-paying client uh, to an engineering firm or a lawyer or or a town planner, if you're a non-paying client, they might they might be willing to to do something when they have nothing better to do. So when they're not busy, but if they're busy, they're, it, it's less likely to be forthcoming. Yeah. Not not impossible, um, uh, but it is less likely to be forthcoming, and. You need to be mindful of that uh, and you need to adjust your expectations as to how quickly things are being turned around. Mm. What, what you can also sometimes find is that uh, organizations take on pro bono work to give more junior people the ability to learn. Um, and uh, you might have a very little bit of senior time supervising that, but really the, the majority of the work will be done by a more junior person who comes at a less lesser cost internally. I've also found working with that, that it, it's very hard um, to demand something of them. You know, you, you do need, at the end of the day, work done. Yeah. And when it's not coming, you need to be able to, to say, you know, it needs to happen. And when someone's volunteering something, that's very difficult. Yeah. You feel like you, you, you just can't ask them what you really want to ask. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, 
So yeah. my thinking uh, on this one, Gerald, as you know, was um, to look at the way in which the pro bono advice could be given uh, in such a way that the consultant could get some payback at a later date. Um, and uh, that that's that's what we thought was a good way to go. Yeah. And, and that, that's how, um, for full disclosure, this is how, how we uh, did the grant funding applications. When we did the um, federal microgrid grant funding, that was probably about a month uh, worth of work for me. Uh, and we said, we can't charge Shields or Core for that. Uh, but if it comes off, then obviously, Como Energy wants to be the main consultant on this. Uh, so, so we put in a month's worth of work in the hope that it would eventuate, and it did not. Um, but uh, that's just how it goes. Whereas uh, when we did this um, Sustainability Victoria application um, for the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub, again, we said we, we, we won't charge you for this uh, work of putting all of this together. But if ultimately Hillsville Core is successful in that application, uh, then we, we are getting a consulting mandate out of this. And this is the work that we ultimately did. It, it was still, that was still also discounted, but um, we, we wanted to work with Jeff on this and, and the other groups that were uh, brought together there. Uh, but it, it was for us, the, the, the payback, uh, the return on investment was uh, that if the project comes off, uh, we would get an, a consulting mandate out of it. Uh, Gerald, do you mean by consulting mandate, do you mean a contracted arrangement um, pre-written prior to doing this um, uh, pro bono work. Is that what you mean? Um, so so you, you could describe the work that we did there as pro bono. For, for us, it, we looked at it more as it's part of our uh, community outreach and our business development. Ultimately, we, we get work out of it if if this grant funding is, uh, is successful. Um, we, we didn't actually sign anything until until afterwards, but there was a uh, there was a clear understanding between uh, Jeff and us uh, as to how this would work. Yeah, and, and the budget that we put in for the grant application also included uh, funding for the consultant uh, to do that work as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, we, we've got two more line items. We probably spend a bit more time on this than I anticipated, but there's some really good uh, there's some really good thinking coming out of this. Uh, community fundraising. This is this is a very interesting one from 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 our perspective because we are just in the midst of having undertaken uh, one fundraise ourselves uh, through crowd equity, being involved with a number of communities that currently fundraise, and um, a, a number of communities that are looking to fundraise in the very near future. Is community fundraising, so setting up a cooperative, for example, in order to raise funds into the cooperative, is that a suitable way of um, funding uh, industry expertise? And, and this look back at sort of the, the example I've given. You want some concept engineering. You want to set. You want eight thousand uh, dollars to do concept engineering, or you might need fifty thousand dollars for the studies for for a planning application or for for a grid process. Um, community fundraise uh, typically is done in the form of um, yeah cooperatives being set up or crowd equity vehicles can be used. Not not yet being used much in Australia. Um, you could do loan notes in the community. Is is that an appropriate way of uh, of raising funds to, uh, for these activities? I think yeah. it's appropriate. I, 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 I guess I'm concerned that um, once again the the uh, ability to generate that amount of money that, that's a lot of sausages to be sizzled or whatever, but. Um, Thirty-two thousand. It does. At least it comes without without a um, um, any um, what's the word for it? obligations. Like you, you're not giving a guarantee, uh, although there's an expectation. But uh, I just wonder whether it can achieve what you need it to achieve. Yeah. Have a very good project. Yeah. When you do a so when you do a sausage sizzle, I would probably put this more into the donations basket. Okay. When, when you say community fundraising, uh, talking about you know you set up a cooperative and, and raise funds into that. Uh, go, go fund me. 
sort of thing. Uh, yeah, or GoFundMe or uh, Possible yeah, okay. or, or, or similar. So it, it can be an appropriate pathway, um, but from, from what I've seen is there's a significant effort in this. And it makes sense if you have a larger funding requirement. But if it's a smaller funding requirement, it, it, it becomes more challenging. So, so it is probably more appropriate for, for larger fundraisers. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, maybe possible, um, I, I've seen a lot of activities on there that uh, where, you, where people just raise a few thousand dollars uh, for a very specific purpose that people can get behind. Um, but if you say, I need a concept engineering to do something, the, the other challenge that I see there is um, you can't show them anything yet because the concept engineering hasn't been done yet. So how, how do you create the, uh, the, the, the visual impression of what you want to achieve if, if, if that's what you're funding? Now, the last one I put down here in, in my list, and I'm happy to add more, is sweat equity. Uh, so this is a process where, um, I don't know who's familiar with that concept, where you say, we as a community, we want a solar farm uh, on, on the edge of town. Uh, we, we create a cooperative um, to ultimately fund this. But in the meantime, while we haven't funded the cooperative yet, because once we funded it, we could just pay for it. Uh, for, for the for the specialist services, but while while we, while we're waiting for funding to come in, or until we start our fundraising, we allow other people to take a stake in the cooperative as well, in order to pay notionally, not in cash, but in in a membership right, uh, for services. Uh, that's often called sweat equity, where people uh, receive equity for an effort they put in. So they receive a stake in the project for something they do. Uh, who is familiar with that concept? No, that's, that's interesting because I think this could be a really important uh, pathway for communities uh, to, to explore. And um, that actually gives me an idea that I, I might want to offer a webinar on that, on that question at some stage. Uh, this, this is really interesting that uh, this is a very un, unknown concept. So the, the concept is you, you, might, you might build you might ultimately want to build a solar farm that, that costs you a million dollars. Communities have raised a million dollars on many occasions. That, that's a completely achievable target. You, you, you might be surprised to hear that. You might need $50,000 early activities with consultants. One way to do that is you could say, I, I, I find another source of cash and pay you for your work. Another way you can do this is you can say, I can't pay you because I have no source of cash. But if the project goes ahead, you get a stake in the project that is equivalent to the value that you have created. And if you have, your services are worth $50,000, you might get a $50,000 stake in the million dollar business uh, that the cooperative ultimately carries. You might have to give them a bit more because they do it very early on when it's very risky. So you might, give, you might need to give them, offer them a bit more, but it, it, it is a way that you can notionally pay for people to come in and do certain activities. So it's effectively a payment um, through a, fu a future stake in the project. I had and the experience of my son doing this, Gerald, uh, with a startup company that mm -hmm. had very few uh, funds. Um, and the people that they got working for them in the beginning were all given shares in the company. Yeah, mm. that, that's exactly the model. Mm. Um, now, one of the challenges, if, if people haven't really heard of this concept, is uh, one of uh, the core issue is valuation. If somebody does a concept design today that might cost you $8,000 if you commission it uh, with an engineering house, uh, for a million dollar project that might uh, come to life in, in two years time, how do you say what that is worth today? So that, that, that's the main challenge in, uh, in using sweat equity to pay for project services. Uh, it's very, very hard to identify the correct value and how that is attributed. I think you would find that a lot of businesses are willing to engage in this and, and to pursue such stakes for sweat. Uh, because they recognize that not everyone can pay for certain activities early on. 
right? So I think community groups should probably explore this a bit more. And I, I will really think about whether whether we can put on a webinar uh, Gerald, to, to explain that concept. Gerald, what's to stop a business over sort of yeah. blowing their um, their story and their value to uh, and and that would be well and truly above the expertise um, of the community group to actually know, you know, how much does a um, an advanced training solar engineer cost these days? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, and they could say anything almost. Yes, yeah, uh, and and that that goes to the question: What is the correct value that you attribute to that? It, it's also a question of um, how clearly can you define what you expect for that stake. So, so that, that, that's a key question. What do you expect? Uh, if somebody gets a stake of X percent in the business or of X dollars in a certain assumed value, what do you actually expect them to do for that? I think this is one of the really difficult things for community groups that don't have the expertise mm -hmm. because yeah. uh, it's very difficult to really work out what is required. You're often dependent on the expert um, providing you with the framework that yeah. they think is necessary. Yeah, yeah, uh, I think that that that's that's absolutely right, uh, and that that is a hurdle to using this really useful tool for community energy groups. But I I, I think uh, what what Tim said is uh, is absolutely correct. How do you correctly assess what these people can do, what it should cost, uh, and and how do we value that into the project? I think I think we leave this exercise off here. Um, this was excellent uh, to go through. I hope the next two slides will, will do a little bit uh, faster. This first one here, I, I was hoping to highlight a number of uh, differences. So we, we are again talking about, you want a small solar farm on the outer, uh, outskirts of, of town. Um, and you, you need to talk about, you, you need to consider expertise and access uh, to, 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 to knowledge that is required and how that is located between the community and the industry. And I, I want to see what we can draw out here. This is, I, have, I have a certain expectation where, where some of these items might land, but I want to see where, where you think uh, it might land. So when, when it comes to selecting a good site for a solar farm, I've got uh, each, each of these tiles in green for community and in red for the industry. Let's start with the community. Would the community be able to identify a site easily, or would that be hard for the community? And requires it does it require a high level of expertise or a low level of expertise? Where would you position yourself? Somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle of expertise. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that's right. And some, some aspects, the community will be by far better to guide than industry. But industry also has certain knowledge. Um, and so we need to, so community, so it's a task that is close to the community, but it's somewhere in the middle. But it's also close to industry. Uh, because the industry will have a different way of looking at a site. Today, I was out uh, at a site uh, down on the Monica Peninsula and spoke to a community group, and they said, we'd, we'd love a site here because um, the developer can't move any further beyond this area, and it could power this area here, and uh, there's no impact on, on neighbors over there. I was looking at the site and said, this is interesting because uh, in terms of its elevation profile, it was quite suitable. Um, in terms of the ability to put screening vegetation up so that there's no visual impact on neighbors. Uh, so I, I saw the site with different eyes. Mm -hmm. So each of us has a certain, certain ability to, to look at the site. Different lens. But different lens, that's right. Now, when it, when it comes to site history, who knows the site history better? Community. The community knows the site better. Uh, so the community has a very high ability uh, to, to assess us, uh, the site history. And we had that in Goulburn. Uh, on, on the site that we're building the solar farm on, there was actually uh, uh, petrochemical storage. But it goes 50 years, uh, 50 years back in, in the past. But it might have impacts today. Uh, 
none of our site searches would reveal that. So industry often has the ability to assess a site, but by far not as well as locals that know, ah, that business was uh, on that site in the past. So I would actually put industry much lower in terms of site history. Um, planning application. Who can, who can work on the planning application better? And does it require a lot of skill or not? Uh, when you're talking about community, you're also talking about our community leaders, like our, our councils? No, I'm, I'm talking about the community energy group that you all represent here tonight. Low. You've got a low skill, okay. Low for planning, yeah. Okay. So, so you sit relatively low and uh, industry, you reckon high? Mm. Yeah. Um, can I offer an alternative view? Yeah. We actually find that community groups are often really well able to guide the planning process because they know the local mayor and the planning officer. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't underestimate that. Um, if, we go to, if we go to a town, so I'm, I'm based in Brisbane, Jonathan is based in, uh, in Sydney. We have a strong regional footprint with our projects, but we are not regional. Yeah. Uh, so we actually thought, we, we would probably actually turn it around. We would actually say communities have a high skill to manage that engagement process and industry probably has only a very modest ability to, to guide that process because planning is all about understanding the local context. Mm -hmm. you, you, you could argue there's also an element where planning is a very technical thing and obviously industry can handle that. So maybe we put industry somewhere in the middle of high and low skill, but we find community groups very, very capable in mm. managing the planning side. Okay. Engineering. Industry way above. Yeah, okay. And yeah. community is probably uh, relatively low. Yeah. Uh, technology selection. What's it? Industry. Same? Industry. Yeah. Mm. Uh, network studies. So this is where you go to uh, to, to Osgrid or uh, United Energy or uh, someone like that and undertake studies with them as to whether, whether your solar farm will trip the network. Definitely industry. I would probably put it somewhere up here. Yeah. Uh, that's, <laughs> and community groups less so. Finance. This mm. is an interesting one. Uh, who has the better ability to finance a community solar farm? A community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we find uh, does uh, does community have a high skill or a low skill in this? Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think it should sit really far over on the community side. But um, is the community skilled or less skilled in this field? Depends on the makeup of the committee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Hillsville Core is very unskilled. We have nobody who has fundraising experience. Yeah. Ray, where would you put uh, CEN? I, I'd probably agree with what Jeff just said. Um, okay. Yeah, so, not, very, not very strong on that. Yeah. Um, so is industry experience in uh, raising funds? I'd say yes, but not in the community. So, so industry might have a high skill, uh, but... I'm not sure it's really a task that typically sits with industry unless you go into the finance industry. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't sit very comfortably in the <clears> industry <throat> space mm -hmm. uh, be because at that scale, it's a community activity. Mm -hmm. Community engagement. Community. Yeah. High skill or low skill? Mm -hmm. High. Not quite so high, I wouldn't think. Not Not too high, but I, yeah. I, I'd, I'd probably say certainly a, a, a great skill speaking to neighbors. That, that's the most important form of engagement, uh, holding town hall meetings and so on. Commu uh, industry, community engagement, I'd say typically a very low skill. It should probably sit more with industry, um, but industry is often not doing this particularly well. So I, I'd probably drag that down here. Probably not very well on their own, but I think when they work in conjunction with a community energy group, they really turbocharge or can turbocharge the community group. Yeah. 
when it comes to construction, who, who is able to manage that well? Industry. Industry. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I, I think the pattern that we're, uh, and, and less so the community, I think the pattern that we see here is uh, the technical skills that industry is really strong in compared to communities. But there are also skills that industry is lacking that is around engagement, site history, planning, certain aspects of site selection, certain aspects of finance, where communities have uh, bring the higher skill set mm. than, than industry does, uh, where, where it sits more naturally in the community. And I think this is something that, that I would love you to reflect on. Community energy groups have an incredible value to bring to any renewable energy project that is community scale because of their local footprint and because of their local connections. And because they're often not only driven by, by doing the next project and, and a profit target and a turnover target, and yeah, we, we, we don't have clearly formulated targets because we do development and it's, it's a hazardous activity. But of course, we are, we are looking at, you know, we've got staff on board now. We need to turn a certain amount of profit every year in order to pay for that staff. Uh, so so, so that's, that, that's just a specific angle that industry has to square off whereas community groups don't have that constraint, but community groups have really strong features in any of these projects. And I'd really invite you to, 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 to explore these uh, when you have the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Now, Gerald, uh, yeah? I'm not sure when you're planning a break, but I think we need to think about it fairly okay. soon. We've been going for over an hour. Okay, uh, just give me a, one more moment. Um, one more slide uh, before we then go into some of the other breakout activities. What I wanted to explore here very briefly is a risk profile and cost. So any community energy project that you do has, you need to spend money over time in order to drive it forward. And initially that's not, not very much, but then it rises rapidly. And when you, when you do m- more detailed engineering, grid studies, uh, planning applications, and then peters out when it gets construction ready. And uh, there's a risk profile uh, that people uh, that, that people experience. While you have not spent much money to de-risk a project, you have a very high risk. And as you do a lot more work and uh, the project becomes more real, the risk level drops off. So at the beginning, you have a very high risk and you have spent very little. At the end, you have spent a lot, but you have a very low risk. Now, if green is the community, where would you like to see the community be most active? When it's very risky and you don't need much money, when it's in the middle, or when the project is no longer very risky, but you have, a lot of, uh, you have spent a lot of money. How much risk can your community tolerate? Where do you need to sit in order to be comfortable? How risky can the project be? Sorry, what sort of risk are we talking about? Like the, 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 the risk that the project doesn't go ahead really? and that you lose all the money yeah. that you have spent. Yeah. Okay. It, it almost seems like risk and cost should multiply each other because you know your risk decreases. Um, you know, yeah. as, your, as your costs. Yeah. The lower the risk is high, you multiply those out and you know you you risk a high risk of losing a little. Yeah. It's kind of like they need to multiply. So I, I find it really a hard question to answer. Uh, okay, that, that's a very interesting observation. Uh, and I need to think on my feet and offer an alternative uh, outcome to the one that I had expected. <laughs> um, so in, in, in some ways you're saying, uh, Mike, you could actually be engaged here when it's very risky, but you, you're not spending a lot. Yeah. And you could also be engaged here when it's not very risky. So you, it, it's a risk that you can tolerate because, you know, decisions that you make as a community, say you have set up your fundraising vehicle, you've set up your cooperative, you've raised a million dollars, you can spend that because it's no longer very risky. So, so you can tolerate that because it's low risk. And is that where, where you... Where are you coming out, Mike? I'm too scared to say. <laughs> yeah, say it. Go, go for it. Because 
partly if you're not involved at the start, you don't necessarily have control over the computer, the community, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> expectations or, or perhaps direction of the project. So if you're not in the first part, yeah. you, you can't, you know, be um, you're not necessarily going to have control about this. Yeah. So, so you... Even the very the very nature of what we're talking about tonight is is that a community group gets together with a vision and and a desire to 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 achieve an outcome and and they have to drive it and, and I, so I see I see um, the community in the first part of the time frame on on the left. Okay. That, because yeah, because that, because that's where that's where it all begins. Where you formulate it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, Okay, it's interesting. So, so my expectation was, uh, and I, I'm, I'm glad I'm being challenged. This is why I wanted to to do this exercise. Um, Neil, really interesting observation. You say we need to be involved here in order to actually drive the story. Mm. I thought the community would end up here at the back end, where it is less risky, uh, because that that's what we find. You need to spend a significant amount of money to get up this um, th this curve, or get down that curve and this is where, where we see really industry to be active industry can fund these activities because we work on multiple projects and if one goes sour we, we run a loss on that project but we do another project and that might might become reality and and can cross subsidize just wanted to give you sort of an idea sort of lining up securing the land you know with with adequate leases and uh, everyone having negotiated the, uh, the lease over the land you're looking at about $5,000 and you normally do that quite early on. A, a planning application um, with all costs in terms of drawing up designs and uh, doing a number of studies can easily cost you $50,000. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's something that you still do relatively soon because it is um, more palatable to do that first. The grid studies working connecting your, your small solar farm to the network, you're probably looking at somewhere around $250,000 plus. Uh, and that, that's just the studies. That's the engineering work that needs to go in before you build. So, so that, that's a very, very significant amount of money for a, for a solar farm. That, that's why sort of a you know, rooftop solar on, on the rec reserve it might, be, might be a better outcome. If you're talking about these sorts of uh, amounts of money that somebody needs to spend. And so I agree with Neil, he has a really important role for the community. I think there's also a significant role for the community here at the back end, namely taking on the project and funding it once the risk has been taken out and money has been spent and needs to be paid and repaid ultimately. But um, there's an intermediate area here where industry is really important as a partner because this is the sort of money that you need to spend in order to get to a project that the community can fund. Wow. Yes. Anyway, I, I might, I might um, uh, Jeff, how much, how much break do, do we need to allow? Uh, I think five minutes is probably enough. Yeah. Would everyone sure. agree with that? Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Take five minutes. It's now uh, 20 past eight. Uh, so if we come back at 25 past on the dot. And uh, if you just uh, mute your microphones and stop your videos, uh, we'll, we'll come back in five minutes' time. Um, so w welcome back. Um, so in, in the second uh, part of this uh, session, I want to look at two actual industry documents that ultimately would be in front of a committee of a community energy group. One is a disclosure document for a cooperative uh, a real life project um, uh, that I looked at uh, a few years ago when I was teaching a, uh, a master's program at, at the University of Queensland on renewable energy law. Um, and I thought it was a really good example to explore um, about the community industry collaboration in that project, which is the Flyers Creek Wind Farm. This was by a commercial developer called Infigen, and a, a local group had formed and was in the process of setting up this cooperative and the purpose was for this cooperative to raise the funds to buy one wind turbine out of the Flyers Creek wind farm. Um, so, so I just
just wanted to highlight three questions that I want to explore. I was hoping to, to split this into two groups, um, but given that our uh, our session, our, our group is relatively small, uh, we, we might just take uh, just do it as one group and not do breakout sessions and uh, separate meeting rooms. So I'm hoping to come up with answers to some of these questions. What is the model of community participation? How is the role of the community secured in the project? And is this a good arrangement? I think that speaks to something that uh, uh, Neil touched upon a moment ago. And how is the community supported by industry? And is that a good arrangement? The first question is, I think, probably relatively easy to answer. What is the model of community participation in this project? Would anyone like to hazard a guess or ha hazard an answer? Actually, has, has anyone read uh, the disclosure document ahead of tonight? Excellent, Neil. Anyone else? Sorry, I can't see everyone. No. Okay, so Neil, Neil is the only one. So Neil, I might have to pick on you in this case. Um, but we, we, we'll draw out just a couple of key features. Um, I also and, read it too. Oh, excellent, Tim. Excellent. So I'll, I'll pick on you as well. Um, so Neil, what, what is the model of community participation? Well, it's a registered co-op, yeah. and, but, and uh, so it's a membership model. It's a membership model. And how is, how is that cooperative? What, what's the role of the cooperative in the project? How, 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 is, it, how is it tied into the project? Um, good question. It's tied... There's a there's a, a stated uh, relationship um, with a, an energy company. I don't know whether it's real or fictitious. Um, and they've been the drivers of this Fryers Creek wind farm from the start, by the looks of it. Yeah, they would have been. Yeah. Uh, Tim, can can you help uh, draw draw out of more of sort of that relationship that um, this co uh, cooperative would be in? Well, formal is a very starter um, comment. Yeah. The, um, the financial sort of outcomes and the expectations for that group um, would appear to be quite onerous to some extent. And um, I don't quite know um, how the individual shareholders represent necessarily the community. And that's one of my questions with all mm -hmm. of this. Um, you know, you've got a community group representing a few perhaps. And mm -hmm. um, I wonder how the industry manages that and even the power companies because... Mm -hmm this and this is a more general question but the business that you're in for example and i'm not picking on your business particularly but that no. is an example it's kind of like a mesh business that seeks customers from the community and uses expertise to financially gain for yourself now i know that there's to an extent, environmental ambition and, um, mm. uh, you know, um, imperatives for you guys as well. Mm. But essentially, it's a business as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, I suppose I come at this a bit cynically, thinking how is the split of effort and profit um, mm managed so you know as a committee member i'd be looking at that how does it work because usually these kind of documents you know they have a clear uh impression of uh, they give a clear impression of who's responsible for what mm -hmm. and it's quite difficult from this document to work out the advantages i see that there's some um yeah it was a challenging document to get through quickly. Yeah. Okay. At least. <clears throat> yeah. They brought up those thoughts. That's all. 
Yeah, no, uh, I think that that that's all valid, and um, can't fault you for for these comments. Um, so it is a registered cooperative. It's a membership model in that cooperative. This cooperative would have bought one wind turbine. So it's the purchase of one wind tur turbine. Um, in order to derive financial benefit for the cooperative members. So whoever has invested into the cooperative ultimately receives financial benefit from owning one wind turbine and getting the energy output sold in the market and, and, and getting a financial return from that. Um, so, that, that, that's that's the model of community participation, uh, and as as you identify correctly, if if I hear that co um, sort of between the lines, the cooperative membership is not necessarily the community. No, it's maybe a proxy of the community. It's maybe an opportunity for the community, but it is not the community. Um, I think we might need to leave. The answer, so what is the model of community participation? It's an opportunity for, um, for cooperative investment. Uh, but it's, uh, it is not only bestowing community benefits. So how is the role of the community secured in the project? And is that a good arrangement? Um, I, might, I might help through this a little bit because uh, only two people have read the document and this was probably a little bit more hidden away. So the community would physically own that wind turbine. So what, what Flies Creek Wind Farm said is, we give you a license. So they had secured the land for the wind, uh, wind farm overall. And they said, we give you a license to put one wind turbine here. And we, we get it built for you, but it's effectively a contractual arrangement uh, a license, it's a, it's, a, it's a contract between Flyers Creek Wind Farm and, and the cooperative. And, and uh, that arrangement would also allow them to effectively use the uh, transmission infrastructure that the wind farm has to build in order to get the energy sold in the market. So there's a contractual arrangement. Uh, I might help with this question uh, so that we can move on to the next one. Um, uh, uh, next topic, uh, just keeping an eye on, on the time here. The reason why I think this is a problematic arrangement is the community has one wind turbine uh, under management. It's, it's a very lumpy risk, a wind turbine. If the wind turbine stops, it stops. If it needs to be maintained, it might take six to nine months until it can be maintained. If you need lifting equipment in order to, to repair something, you might have to wait until a uh, spe uh, specific type of crane is available uh, for that repair. So it's a very lumpy risk. It's not like a solar farm where you know you might have three thousand panels in uh, on a solar farm and ten of them break, and you can get a local electrician any day of the week to replace those panels, and it is working again. It's a, it's a single asset, and if that single asset fails technically. Uh, the community stands to lose financially. So from that perspective, I didn't think that was a very good arrangement. I also didn't like the arrangement, say, if, uh, if a spare part is required for the wind turbine, and say three turbines fail in the Flyers Creek wind turbine at the same time, requiring all the same spare part, and the Flyers Creek wind farm manages the operation uh, and maintenance of, of that entire wind farm, which turbine will they be looking after themselves? Uh, their own wind turbines or the ones that is owned by the community? So that is something that would need to be regulated quite carefully in order to ensure that the community is not disadvantaged. So it's a lumpy, lumpy technical risk. And the, uh, there are complex uh, arrangements between, um, between the wind farm and, and the community. It's not... It's not an area that is very easy to manage. Let's speak about the other uh, item. How is the community supported? Uh, Tim and Neil, did you pick that up from this document? Yeah. So th the cooperative is managed very similar to, to a company. It has a board of directors. 
And typically in a in a cooperative, most of the directors are cooperative members as well. So they have known interest as member and they uh, they represent the membership as directors. However, there's one thing that is different in this cooperative. It has one member that is uh, one director that is not a member. And who is providing that? It's actually the energy company, Infigen, that is developing the Flyers Creek Wind Farm. So there's a, effectively a um, one director of the cooperative is seconded from Infigen, uh, and, and that means effectively from Flyers Creek Wind Farm. And I, I find that a very intriguing uh, concept. Can, can you explore this? So effectively, your, your commercial partner makes available one staff member to sit on your board for the community, for, for the community investment vehicle. What do you think about that arrangement? Well, they're providing technical expertise, hopefully, commercial expertise. Um, sorry, I'm not sure I, I, I caught that correctly. They're providing technical and commercial expertise. Yeah. yeah. It may be a conflict of interest, though, mm. which is a challenge. Yeah. So, Neil, did you think uh, them providing technical and uh, commercial, sorry, I didn't actually write this out, um, providing technical and commercial expertise is a good thing? Yeah, I'm only, I'm only sort of getting to it now. When I read the document just before we started, I, I really didn't have time to contemplate these questions. Yeah, okay. Um, but I, I think you, that, that, that's exactly why they were um, set, sent to sit on the board of, uh, of the cooperative to provide technical and commercial expertise. And uh, in, at first pass, that's a really good idea. Uh, because as, as Jeff said uh, in his introductory remarks, it is very difficult for a community energy group to staff um, an organization that needs to spend money and a significant amount of money potentially with technical expertise because it's not necessarily available in the community. That might change over the years as, as more people have experience in that field. But at the moment, technical expertise is still a scarce resource. And it is, um, it is one way of getting that expertise onto, onto the board of this cooperative. So I think it's it's actually a very laudable approach. What Tim said, however, uh, is also something that was very quickly high up uh, in my mind. It creates a potential conflict of interest. And what 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 does this conflict of interest lie in, Tim? Can you explore that a bit more for us? Well, the objectives of the broader company that runs a solar farm um, may be compromised. Um, or the interests of the community may be reduced in some way. I, I don't know. You have to go through a particular example, but um, mm. it even could be in prioritising maintenance and or giving expectations to the community group how this thing happens. And I can understand that, for example, maintenance regimes on wind farms must be pretty substantial mm. and expensive and that um, uh, the community groups wouldn't necessarily understand those. And that could lead to different outcomes than the community would, would expect or like. Um, there may be real uh, reasonable expect, uh, outcomes, but perhaps contrary to um, the grand ideals of the initial committee. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all spot on. Uh, so uh, I, I drew, tried to draw this issue about uh, maintenance risk earlier because it leads directly into this question of conflict of interest. There will be many cases where the decision-making of the cooperative and of Flyers Creek Wind Farm would be highly aligned, where they have the same interests. Um, uh, say if there's a, is a, a complaint from the neighborhood about noise emissions, they will have the same interest of getting this resolved uh, adequately. Uh, there, there will be certain maintenance tasks or, um, you know, maintenance programs that need to be funded and uh, all of these interests will be aligned and quite appropriately so. But because Infigen is also a service provider 
to that one wind turbine owned by the community. So they need to provide maintenance services. They need to provide grid access. Um, uh, they need to provide monitoring and data uh, about the performance of the wind turbine. In certain areas, the interests of the community uh, organization, the cooperative in this case, and, and Infigen will be uh, uh, opposed to each other. And now the, the, the main source of technical expertise commercial and technical expertise that the cooperative has available is a staff member of the other side of the story of, in of Infigen as, as, the, as the energy company. Uh, so that director would be in many ways conflicted of providing advice to the cooperative in those cases where it matters the most. Mm -hmm. And that means when, when uh, if the relationship was to really go Ori, then um, the community would have no support for those questions. Whereas when, when the relationship is easy, it would have the support. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so, so I think that, that, that is the real risk of, um, of, of seconding a staff member uh, to, to the community. I think there could have been other ways of doing this. Uh, obviously, when they second the staff member, they make a staff member available um, and I assume they would have paid for, for the salary during that time as well. They could have probably provided funding for someone independent of Infigen to sit on the board of the cooperative to advise the cooperative on all of these questions. Um, but that, that's obviously a different proposition than uh, just uh, using a staff member that you already have on your books. Mm. So I, I think it, it's a very laudable a, a attempt of resolving a, a knowledge imbalance between community and, and as we were looking earlier, uh, there, there are certain areas where the community has by far less knowledge than the industry partner, but it, it's a laudable, laudable attempt to resolve this, but it is not necessarily um, resolved perfectly. Um, okay, we might need to move on because I think uh, Jeff will cut me off at uh, 7.55. Um, I wanted to talk about our engagement model, not because I, I want to spruik it here, but uh, because I'm, I know it quite well, and I know I, I had to defend it on many occasions. And uh, I want to give you an opportunity, and please do not hold back. Uh, please give us your honest opinions. Uh, what, what do you think about our engagement model? Uh, can I again ask, has either Neil or Tim uh, have you read uh, the, the document uh, that encapsulates uh, Kuma Energy's proposal, which is actually a real proposal. I've just literally anonymized it from a battery project that we're looking to support. So that is not yet signed, um, but it's, it has gone out to the community. The underlying contractual documentation that sits behind it has not yet been signed, uh, but it is, it is a real example of something that we are currently discussing. It looks really good, Gerald. Where do we sign? <laughs> <laughs> so let, let me first take take everyone uh, uh, along the journey uh, and uh, interestingly what what comes back out here is is a discussion uh, item i think it was was it tim or neil one of you races the community needs to be engaged early and we find that quite often communities have ideas that they take to a certain point so they do what we call early development um and ultimately they want to own a project in a, a SPV sense for special purpose vehicle, so a, a company or a cooperative that that holds the project. How do they get? Uh, and this this goes back to sort of this curve. How do they get from the early engagement to the late engagement? The early engagement of just coming up with the idea of what the community wants, and to the point where they can say, "We go to the community tomorrow and raise funds." to actually build this. Uh, there's an in-between that can be very costly. Not every project is as costly, but if you wanted a solar farm, that, that's what you're looking at. How do you get from here to there? Sort of our model was always that, yes, we are a commercial provider, as, as, as Tim pointed out early, and yes, we do want to make a profit on the risk that we take. What, what we said is community groups don't have the funding available to pay all of these consultants. So there's a real funding gap to develop <laughs> community-scale projects. 
a community could raise the funds today and spend the money, but if the project then didn't go ahead, like we had in Gloucester, we, we spent probably about $50,000 on Gloucester uh, for a 500 kilowatt solar farm. It's not a big one, a very small solar farm. And essential energy came back. You can't do 500, you can do 30. That project is just not viable. So we lost $50,000 on that project. Now, a community group that has raised funds in the local community and loses those funds to such a development risk, they won't be able to walk down the main street. Yeah. Because all the investors will say, where's my money? You lost my money. Because not everyone understands this high risk, little spend, and then risk goes down as you spend more. The community will have very little tolerance for losing money in the development process. That, that's what we find in our engagement with communities. And this is where we said industry needs to step in and provide this as a service. And the way we do this is we, we say we set up a special purpose vehicle, a, a company that holds the project like a vessel. Initially, that vessel might sit with the community, but once we need to put in funding, we take over the vessel by taking over the shares, or sometimes we just incorporate it directly. We then fund it up, develop the project until it's ready for the community to take over once we have done the majority of the development tasks. So by that time, it might have the grid connection approval, the planning approval, the land secured. It might have contracts for the construction and will have a budget and uh, a, a financial model as to how this can ultimately be funded by the community. And then we give the community the right to buy back that, that, that entity. And at that point, we will realize our profit. And the way this works for us is we say, we, we, we would love to tell you exactly how much it costs from here to here, but we don't know. It's development and things happen in development. But all we ask is that we will ultimately be repaid our development expense, whatever we spend, and we spend wisely because we need to fund it, and a, a pre-agreed fee. Uh, so the community that looks at possibly in a more cynical way can say, okay, this is the return that they're expecting. This is what they want to get out of it. And I'm either okay with that or I'm not. And if I'm not okay with it, I don't sign on the dotted line. Gerald, yes? just, just on that, does that mean that if in your example, the community group doesn't go ahead, there's a, a fee that covers your um, development costs? Is that what you're saying? No, no. We, we, have, no... we are taking the view that we, we would never ask a community to pay us anything unless they take over the project. What, what we're and saying is that... It's almost like a no win, no fee strategy. Yeah, well, well, not quite. Well, it, depending on how you want to structure that, <laughs> that, that comment. What, what we're saying is um, the community has the ability to take the project over once it's fully developed. If the community chooses to do so, then we will then we will be paid our fee, and we will get reimbursed for the expenses that we had. The community, if the project doesn't succeed, like the Gloucester project, it just falls over, and we we have to write it off. But do you have the opportunity to to pursue that that proposal um, in another way, in a in a different commercial way? No, if, the, no, if the community no. turns its back on it and doesn't want to proceed. Yeah, and, and this is why we, we have this model of creating a special purpose company, yeah. a profit company that we control during the development process. So we give the community the ability to buy it back at just a nominal $10 and pay our fees. But um, if the community chooses later on not to do so, then they can make that choice. And then we have the ability to take the project forward and build it. Okay. And, and we actually had the situation, uh, I've talked a lot about gold, but it's, it's a great project. It has given us so many examples for everything. Um, so in, in the Goldman project, we developed the project using uh, an inverter technology for the solar farm from Siemens. And it was the only technology in the market at that time that allowed us to do a certain integration of a battery. We were just about to issue our tenders to the construction market to get a price for this project. We, we sent the request for tenders in draft form to the uh, to Community Energy for Goldburn. And I had, it didn't take very long. And I had um, the president on the phone and he said, 
if you put Siemens into this project, we will not take the project back. Okay. Because they took a very principled approach that they didn't want to deal with Siemens because Siemens has a rail signaling contract on the Adani mine. Yeah. And, and they said, we can't support a project that has Siemens in it. Now, we are a commercial business. We actually had less of a concern with Siemens. We think um, large international businesses need, are needed in the renewable energy sector because uh, they provide the balance sheet and the research and development of new products. And they will only do that if they have market opportunities at the end. They need to sell product in renewable energy to ultimately say, we don't need to sell product into coal mining anymore. Yeah. That's our view. And it was not shared by CE4G. But because they are our partner, well, we could have run a very harsh line on this and we could have said, well, tough luck. This is how we develop the project. If you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. You don't have to take the project back. You don't have to fund it. We can go elsewhere. But they're also our partners. And we've worked with them now for uh, three and a half years. So we said, okay, back to the drawing board. And we scrapped all of that. It probably set us back by about six months to find a new technology that can do something comparable. And, but this is sort of where they have, in our model, they have the ability to, to, to take the project back. They don't have the obligation. But in reality, this is just a sort of technical vehicle as to how we interact in a, in a, in a mechanical way. In reality, it is still us supporting the community in their ambition. And their ambition was not to have a, a Siemens in, in the project. Um, but th th that's just sort of the, the, the way we run these relationships. Uh, but it's, um, yeah, ultimately, we, we want communities to take over our projects and communities will only do that uh, if the project meets their ambition. And um, what we probably learned from that is um, we when, we, when we worked this out with uh, CE4G back in 2019 as, as a relationship, we had not defined fully what the community ambition was. And, and that, that's one of the lessons we learned from that, that we need to be much, much clearer with, with each community as to what they want to achieve in an individual project. It's a really valuable learning lesson, that one, isn't it? It just shows us so the value of having a really very thoroughly thought out contract. Uh, I'm wondering about the buyback of the SPV and whether that can be done uh, on a gradual basis, does it need to be done in one hit or can it be done gradually? Mm. And it could be done partly paid for by the turnover of the product that you're creating. Yeah. Over time. <clears throat> Very good question, uh, Mike. So we have actually run both models. So we, we, it took me about 18 months to develop this engagement model with communities. Uh, a lot of thought went into it and uh, it's still evolving somewhat. Um, some In some cases, we, we said, it's a all or nothing buyback. Uh, but in other cases, we, we realized that communities were uncomfortable about the prospect of raising the full amount that might be required. So we said, okay, we might tolerate partial buyback, uh, pi partial stepping in into the project. It, it gets much more complicated when you want to allow sort of that gradual take, taking back of the project. And from, from, from a long-term investment perspective, the challenge that you have is if the community doesn't come in from the outset with the full amount, somebody else needs to go into it because else the project will not be built. And say, say you have a million dollar project in our example, a, a solar farm on, on the outskirts of town, um, and say the community wants to put in half a million dollars, somebody else needs to put half a million dollars in. If the community then wants to increase its stake, that person needs to leave. So you need to find an investor that is willing to gradually take down their investment as the community raises more. And finding that investor is quite a challenging prospect. So grad, a partial investment might be possible. Gradual investment is, is something, it's probably a nut we haven't cracked yet. Yeah, it sounds to me like a, a vehicle for either a bank or an equity fund to get involved with, but I don't know how difficult that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think we, we've got a lot of other issues that we need to resolve first, but uh, it's, it, it, it is definitely a, a valid point. And uh, it, we, we have heard this question before, can you put in more money later on? Uh, there, there's that desire. And I think there's also a, a great opportunity once the project is up and running, you might find some people that were not comfortable at first uh, 
that they'd become comfortable later on and uh, might might be willing to support the project. So it's it's a great uh, it's a great idea and it's a very good question. Mm. Mm. Um, so just one more minute, uh, two more minutes, Gerald, to finish yeah. up. Yeah. Uh, any other questions or any other comments, observations, challenges, discontents? <laughs> No, I like the concept. I think it, my my uh, observation is that it's something that uh, I I thought was a logical step because you know you're talking about needing to put in funds when the community can't afford it, which is in the initial phase when they're going to be reluctant to afford it and find it unable. It's only when they can actually see something, I think, concrete developing that they're more likely to put more money in. So mm. it solves that middle stage problem, which is. So vital to these projects. That sounds yeah. good to me. Yeah. Interestingly, uh, Community Energy for Goldman is, is maybe an outlier there. They raised um, they raised 1.9 million when there was nothing to be seen yet. Wow. Well, I yeah. want their fundraiser. <clears throat> um, <laughs> no, they, 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 but they had worked on this project for years. Well, they, they, I shouldn't say there was nothing to be seen yet. Uh, they had gotten a development application uh, through and ha had planning approval. Um, and they had they knew where the site was, but we, we still had to secure the site uh, sort of formally. And, and that took about uh, 18, 18, 20 months uh, to get that across the line because there was a government-held parcel of land that was particularly difficult. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the, the grid process uh, took a long time because we had to move away from Siemens to an alternative product uh, that, that elongated that time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it, it was not an easy process. And they raised um, just with the sheer energy that the management team there had put into the project over many, many years. And, and the community, uh, really the groundswell of support they had generated, they, they, they raised very, very successfully. How many people were in the community that were raising those funds? Um, I think it was a uh, uh, high 200s uh, that put together 1.9 million. And they have now raised a bit more because um, part of the development process was to increase the battery that we had originally planned. Uh, so they needed to raise some additional funds and they're now sitting at just about 400 investors. Mm. Impressive. I think we, uh, we need to come to a close now, uh, yeah. everyone. And uh, Gerald... Uh, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Um, it's uh, fantastic uh, having someone of your ability, someone of your caliber and experience, um, uh, making yourself available to run this particular program. And uh, I personally appreciate it very much. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone here to express that I express uh, their appreciation as well. Yeah, um, thank you. It was a great pleasure to be here. Yeah, good, good. Um, and uh, of course, the video has been made of the session tonight. And uh, with all the other videos, we'll be going up onto um, a YouTube uh, library. Um, and the uh, link for that I sent uh, yesterday to uh, Emerald and Pakenham. Has that been sent out to you yet? No. Mm. Well, uh, yes, I'm sorry there's been a delay on that. We had some technical problems at our end um, and a lack of volunteer labour to do some of the work that needed to be mm. done. Um, but uh, finally, it's it's been done and all of the links are available now. Mm -hmm. So I'll remind... Um, uh, Mary and Miriam tomorrow uh, to get the, the, the links out to you so you can see all of the videos and you can see this one again as well. Thank you all very much for attending. And um, of course, I also need to thank uh, uh, Pakenham and Emerald for the, the work that they've done and the funding that they've put into this uh, project uh, mm -hmm. and also uh, the Victorian Government and Sustainability Victoria uh, for their funding as well. It's been a great pleasure being able to present this course for you. Um, for those of you who won't be going to the, um, the site on the site visit, um, it's been great having you on this program and I hope it's provided uh, a lot of knowledge and information for you and perhaps even some stimulation to get excited and engaged in uh, the community energy field uh, in your local area. Uh, and for those who are going to come on the site visit, I very much look forward to seeing you up on Mount Tulubawong uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, that's all for now. Uh, I bid you all farewell. Thank you very Thank much. You.